Hey, what's up guys? I finally did what I've been threatening to do for a long time, and that's redo my HTTP API. I'm not calling it REST. Uh, GIS enterprise service level thing from PHP to Node. And in the process of doing that, changing a lot of things along the way. It's been one of my more popular projects. I know a lot of people that are using it. And it's really transformed the way we do a lot of things uh, in our enterprise. As a GIS person, I always want everyone to have a map for everything. But a lot of people don't need a map, they just need a question answered. Is this parcel in a floodplain? Is this location near a school? What's the five closest thing to the other thing? I mean, questions that are spatial in nature and GIS needs to provide an answer for, don't necessarily need a map. And this API that we made, which is just a thin layer on PostGIS, it's been extremely useful. We don't make a project that doesn't touch it in some way or another. And I think other people have found it to be useful too. So it's been fun. But there are a lot of things I didn't like about it. It's uh, not exactly SQL injection safe. Uh, it's not bad, but it's, it, it's not great on that front. And it's in PHP, which is not my favorite language anymore. It never really was, but uh, I think we have better tools. There, there's nothing wrong with PHP. It's fast, it's ubiquitous, it's... There's a hundred different ways to do anything you want to do. It's it's not bad at all. It's just uh, not my favorite thing anymore. And this kind of uh, project, this kind of service-based endpoints really screams out for Node. Node is really good at that sort of thing, and it's really good at handling lots of simultaneous requests. It's event-driven. So Node was the way to go. The thing about these types of frameworks is once you release an API like that to anyone other than yourself, it pretty much has to live for the rest of time. You can't just release that kind of thing and then take it away and have apps you didn't even know were out there break. So you need to do a lot of measure 10 times and cut once type of thinking with this sort of thing. So that's what I did here. I'm really happy with how this framework is working out under Node. And it's out on GitHub. I'll provide a link to that. But just to give you some idea of what it does and how it does it. It is using Node. It's using a framework called Happy, H-A-P-I, which made me very happy. It's it's a kind of app service framework. It's just ex handles everything for you that's usually you have to handle for yourself. Handles cores and JSONP and caching and managing your endpoints and routes and it's just super awesome. And with Happy, I'm using a couple extensions. I'm using Swagger, which will kind of do our documentation for us in a way that was even better than the documentation I was doing by hand in the PHP framework. And I'm using uh, Squell, or SQL, S-Q-U-E-L. Uh, I kind of looked down my nose at SQL Builders a lot because I didn't think SQL was very hard to build. But after the first set of projects and a lot of other other things with this framework, said it's not really that SQL is hard to build, it's that string complex string manipulation is a pain in the ass. That's really what it is. I'm using Squell to build the SQL call for me, which does, besides handling a lot of that complex uh, bug prone and injection prone string manipulation it, it handles all that for me and it makes the code a lot cleaner too. So I'm using Swell for that. I'm using a project called Joy, J-O-I, which I think is made by the folks that, that do Happy to do validation of inputs when they come in and set defaults and that's reflected in the documentation. So 
see there's not very many dependencies it's a lot easier with node you can just grab the project and go node install it install all that stuff and you're good to go with php getting it set up and configured just right with your web server and your database stuff was kind of I don't think there's any two PHP servers in the world that are set up the exact same way. So it could be a little bit tricky. This is very easy. You just go node install. All your dependencies are there and you're good to go. That's what it's built with. It's uh, very straightforward. The server part uh, basically gets, gets some dependencies. I'm using Babel, which means you can use ES6 in any of this. But all I'm really using it for is uh, template strings. So I'm not doing anything really complicated with it. So we'll make a server. We're going to support cores. It's also supporting JSONP because using cores on old IE is no fun. So we'll register our server. Uh, we're using a happy extension called router that basically means it will get all of our routes in a folder, so we don't have to add these one at a time. So it's adding all the routes from our routes folder, and it's setting up our swagger, our documentation, over here, and then it starts our server. That's it. That's the whole server part of it. That starts it all up. Now it's using a configuration file to do pretty much everything. Configuration here is you'll need to require whatever database server you're using or database driver here I'm just using PG or Postgres we're setting a base path this is for your swagger documentation uh, this is you'd want to change that if uh, you're behind a proxy so your URLs a little different your database connection or connections here I've got one set up and you just put in your username and password in the server and the database any caching you want for these services for the search for the autocomplete and the really fast search before that was a really hard thing to do uh, in the way I had it set up in PHP and that was partly my fault but it's very schema specific so that that whole service file is just a giant mess here the search is set up in the config and you set up the type of search you want what table that hits the columns to return and it's looking for you have to have these particular columns returned let's say up here in the documentation and the where field of how it's going to query it and you notice we're doing some substitution here when it gets to the actual SQL call and how you want to format what the query coming in was. Like for address, I'm doing a, a, a text search, so I'm kind of splitting it up with an ampersand. With other things, I'm doing a trim. Uh, so it depends on, on what I'm looking at. So that way you can very easily add new types of searches right there, right in your config. And then fetch, and here you'd put in your particular functions for taking a connection and a, and a SQL and returning the results. So that's it. That's the whole config. That's how you set up pretty much everything. The individual routes, look at some of these. They're very straightforward. There's really only two, one function and the module return. The function will just be to format uh, and create the SQL. So I'm making a couple, see here I'm using template strings, making a couple of things uh, from the input and then I'll use Squell to do the select from and the fields and the where and the order and the limit and then it spits out that uh, SQL. So Squell is, it is really great. It's uh, See, this is a lot neater than my string manipulation crap I had in the PHP version of the project. Then you go your module exports, you're doing your method, you're doing get for all these because this is a read-only type of service. Uh, but you could, you could change that here as well. You're setting the path and there's really two different ways to do service versioning. 
One is to put it in your path, and the other is to use uh, content manipulation as, as just part of REST. Content manipulation is probably the proper way to do it, but it makes it harder to kind of see and test stuff right in your browser. So I just do this part of the path. So if you wanted to say make a breaking change, you could make a new file in routes called nearest underscore v2, change this path to v2, then you'd have both of those services running and nothing would break anywhere. You see how we're doing the documentation, we're doing a little description and notes and putting in tags. And then for each parameter, we'll put in documentation there too and validation. Using this JOI to do that, we'll say the table input is a string, it's required, so it actually won't fire if it's not passed, and it gives a description of it. And here we're doing strings and numbers. You could do a number as an integer and set mins and maxes. You can set default values. Uh, you can do very complex stuff with Joy. You can do regex-based uh, checking. It's, it's, it's really cool. It's a way to really sanitize and make your stuff, make sure your stuff coming in is what you think it is. What I'm doing uh, with this project is I'm having the, the uh, non-optional parameters as part of the path and the optional parameters as part of the query string. That's how I'm separating that out. That's just a philosophical thing. You don't, you can have everything part of the path, but it becomes kind of weird. If they don't need to pass something, then you've got like a slash slash there and it just gets ugly. So that's how I'm dividing that up. You have your SQL processor, you have your uh, basically documentation and inputs here setting our JSONP so if someone sends a callback as part of the uh, query string it automatically comes back as JSONP get our, our cache handling from the config and here we're telling it to use from our config that post GIS fetch function and that's it that's how you set up a service that's that's how easy that is so the only weird one is the search and for that we're basically taking all of the input different types of searches you want to do and then building the SQL from what's in our config file for each of those. That's a, that's a, a much nicer cleaner way to, it, it makes it much easier to do a service it's a lot more SQL safe it's it's just really good. Now I told you I was using Swagger for documentation when you go to your endpoint slash documentation it will automatically generate all of this for you. Here's all those services, and it gives you the path, a little bit about what it is. We can go into and expand that stuff. I want to get the bounding box for a set of features. It's telling us the parameters. It's showing this in bold because it's required. It's showing required here. It's showing our defa defaults we put in here in our filter, a little description, whether it's string or integer, that's all generated automatically from you, just from that tiny bit of documentation in the route. So if we would go voting precincts, and that's, I made the default geometry column geom, because that's the new cool, but almost all of our stuff is the underscore geom, because that was the old cool. So let's say we want to turn the bounty box in, uh, uh, WGS84. Then we'll go where the precinct number is 100. I think there's one of those. You can try it out. It gives us the entire path it built. So you could just copy and paste that straight into somewhere else into another browser window. And it will show you the returned result. Uh, here's the response body. So you see right in the documentation what it looks like, the response code, and all of the response headers. The allow methods, the cores, the the uh, keep alive, the all that stuff is, is sent back. It's very, very handy for debugging and seeing what's going right or wrong. And uh, go back to 
Let's pull that back up again. See, this is coming back as straight JSON. If we send a callback argument, callback equals high, and see now it's coming back as JSONP. So you have that support for old Internet Explorer browsers. IE8 in Coors is kind of like impossible, and IE9 uses this really crappy IE9 thing. Uh, jQuery kind of does all that behind the scenes if you're using jQuery, but if you're, you're doing it by just raw JavaScript, Coors in IE less than 10 kind of sucks. So JSONP is still handy, even though it's kind of icky. Squirrel well happy. Here's our documentation. See, all this stuff is documented, and if you had, say, a V2 of a VBox, that would appear right below that. You could easily pull those back up and run your queries through it. So this is just a really cool part of, of redoing this, is using Swagger and getting all of this much better documentation essentially for free. So that's cool beans. Uh, Performance-wise, uh, this new framework in Node is roughly twice as fast on the, and that's pretty consistent between our production server and my my PC while I was testing this stuff out. Uh, it's roughly twice as fast, and that's for both a single call and loading up some heavier traffic with Apache Bench. Uh, it's about twice as fast, and you would expect that from Node is just event-driven and a lot quicker, and PHP, depending on how you're running it, isn't. It's, you're usually running it in fast CGI or, or something. It's, it's just not as fast. But that being said, it's one of those things where it's twice as fast, but the slow one is so fast you probably don't care anyway, but it is twice as fast, and it's... Uh, also a little bit friendlier on on the CPU, but again, it's, it's very minor. So that's it, that's the new framework. The old framework is still available on the project in the V1 branch, and Node is now, this new one is now master. So, and there's some notes on, on getting it set up in there. And I really like this way of doing it a lot better. Happy is a great framework, the documentation, being able to work through it all live in the browser is awesome. So I hope you enjoy it and find it useful, and I will catch you next time. Bye-bye.